most people in America are looking at how do I make a life worth living and return worth having and that is true because if you've been raised in a proper setting if you've been paying attention to what goes on for your family in that setting you recognize when finances are tight you recognize when finances are flourishing and you recognize that it takes money sadly to rule your life you see if we didn't have income if we didn't have business revenue if we didn't have the opportunity to earn we would not have much of a life in America we have people that want to take away those rights from all kinds of people they want to interfere with a person's right to pursue life liberty and happiness underneath the accordances of our United States Constitution it was very much a part of the forefathers ideology that people would keep a faith as the foundation of their life regardless of the ideology the freedom of religion is a part of our First Amendment to the Constitution. It's something I talk about ad nauseum because we also have the right to have freedom of assembly. And freedom of assembly means that we have the right to put together ourselves in groups and try to make a difference in the world or try to have fellowship and friendship and sports events and anything, I would presume. And that's my humble interpretation of that law. I could be completely wrong, but I think it's pretty apical despite that. You see, I don't have to be a legal eagle to know the laws of American society, and I don't have to be a moron about how to apply them to the everyday concepts of living. That freedom of assembly means I have the right to go just about anywhere to participate, provided that I am welcome there. I have been a few, on a few occasions the only white bread in a black religious church, but I stayed for a few minutes, and then I might have left, or I stayed for the whole service and enjoyed myself, because in America we have the right to be somewhere. And the truth is, most people are politically correct and polite. There are, however, people in America that think that their rightest attitude is right for everyone. That they think and they say out loud to people in indiscretion and in inappropriateness and in rudeness, I could live your life better than you. Really? I'm not seeing your life as an example or mentorship for me. Do you? You see, in life, part of our life is to find a family. We might have a family of origin, and we all know the stories, both of good and of bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will, about families of origin, families of abuse, families of discipline, families of light, families of dark, families, and I don't mean color there, I'm talking about those that raise children up to be productive, healthy society members, those that struggle because of their own challenges and depression and whatnot, and impossibilities of paying for as many kids that they have managed to procreate and create, whether accidental or not. And my late father was always great about joking about that. Well, the first two were planned and the rest of you were not. You know, you're like, oh, thanks, Dad. Glad you loved us enough to keep us. But the reality is that in life we have to take that with a grain of salt because he loved us all the same. And one of the marvelous things about my late mom and dad was that they always strived, at least when we were younger, up until probably in my, gosh, mid-30s to early 40s, to make sure that everybody had the same number of gifts around the tree, or at some point they said, okay, it's not the same number of gifts, but the same on, amount of value that they spent around Christmas time. Isn't that interesting? That my parents were always concerned, and probably they had friends in their 60-60 group or their, their church groups or whatever who helped to kind of them to de-stress about the realities of their life of having such a large brood, that they really were saying the best thing you can do for your kids is make sure they all feel loved equally. And I'm pretty sure that we all pretty much did or do up until probably when they got into their 70s and early 80s. The reality is in life that we have to tell part of our life story so people can sort of appreciate us and understand us a little bit more, but at the same time, as a part of a service-oriented attitude, we have to be willing to listen. And listening is skills are something that many young people are suffering with. The best gift that you can give your child at any age, any day, any situation is the gift of listening. And the beautiful thing about being a child in my family home was that we often had let's pretend records. That was way back when, way back when, when they still had record players, 45s and whatnot. And we were allowed to listen to music, and we were allowed to listen to what I was talking about, which is stories. Something that I know that my siblings did for their children and, their, and God's glory was giving them some story time things out of the Christian bent that helped to teach children about the right and wrongness of relationships. 
and whatnot. Now, that's just my humble concept of how to teach a child to listen, but you don't blast the music at them to break their eardrums or ruin their hearing in their late years. And you pick age-appropriate music for a child, even though they might love hip-hop at age three and they might be the best dancer by age five. That's marvelous. What a gift, because it literally says in the Bible, dance unto the Lord, and we like that. But the reality is in life we have to give our children skill sets and encourage the gift of the soul that the Lord has put within each child. And by the time they're at age 14 and 15, they're sort of lost and they still don't need their parents, but they need their parents to be kind of hip and cool, but at the same time give them the information about society's rules. That, hey, this is okay, this isn't okay. This is how you treat people, this is how you don't treat people. This is how you be good with your girlfriends and have them for the rest of your life, and this is how you screw up your life, and you'll go on to college and never see them again. So make this time last, make this time a great memory, so that sometimes there'll be a blast from the past when you go back to your family, your high school reunion, and you'll say, wasn't that fun? Do you remember when? But you'll be bringing to that space not your family of origin, you'll be bringing to that space your family of choice. And a part of life balance, family of choice, is a secondary point that's essential to living a healthy life and a healthy lifestyle is a part of that, regardless of the predilection or the preference of your child, which the Lord puts into a child, most of the time, unless you totally screwed up and made them fearful in some way. But, and that's what some people will say, nature versus nurture, and we're not going to get into that topic, because if the God in heaven was upset, if mother and father of the divine architect of our world was pissed off at some type of preference, he wouldn't make it anymore. Now, in life we have moments of time to speak the truth, and what's most important in any situation is love. The foundation of peace in our world is having a peace-oriented child. The foundation of empathy and compassion and philanthropy in our world is a love-oriented child. And all of that is based on regard and respect so that your child has the maturity to say, we can agree to disagree. But some people abuse that concept even today. That we can agree to disagree, but you're completely wrong. No, it's my life that I'm focused on, not yours. And you've never invited me into your life. You've never invited me into your home. You've never invited me very often for dinner unless it was a family thing. And you've never invited me to follow your kids in sports. You've never invited, you know. So get a grip and focus on your life if you're older and have siblings. But what I can say is that God has to be the premise in every way. And what we're talking about today in our sermons and what we're talking about today in our communities is how do we keep American society full of peace and devoid of hate. And the only way to do that is when people of all ages, stages, walks of life, religions, ethnicities, and color skins get where their rights begin and end in a moral society. At no time do you have the right to put your hand on another human being's life, period, without their consent and permission. At the same time, if you have had a discord, a communication breakdown with someone in which you have had a good amount of time and intimate conversation with, you are responsible and liable to the Lord to try to fix it and make it right without involving a whole community that will ruin it in spite. You see, the Lord God plans our relationships, but there are people who want to be God and people who want to profile, and people who want to stalk, and people who want to harangue, and people who want to harass, and people who want to abuse. And the beard on my face is a perfect example of abusers in American society. People who never learn to keep their hands to themselves at age five. Arrogant men, violent women who think they have the right to teach what kind of lesson to a man in the night? That you're a coward living in the shadows, that you're a Satanist person who's an abuser, immoral, and unright with God? Because I guarantee you, there is no God concept in any part of the world that says you have the right to harm another person's life, their faith, their fashion, their anything in this world. 